Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today for the Appalachian Food for Health Diabetes Prevention event. I'm Dr. Margo Riggs with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And I'm a site here in Eastern Kentucky. And I apologize for my dog barking in the background. It always happens, right? Um, so I'm here in Eastern Kentucky working with Shaping Our Appalachian Region, or SOAR. And I'm an epidemiologist. I think most everyone finally knows what that means after a year of the COVID pandemic. Um, I study the patterns of disease and have worked in public health prevention and outbreak response with CDC for over 16 years. Uh, I've worked in various locations around the US and throughout the world. And I'm very glad to be back home as a native Kentuckian. I grew up in Kentucky, but my husband and I are grateful to have relocated here in the beautiful mountains of Eastern Kentucky. So uh, let's start by getting to know each other a little better. Some folks are already doing this, but if you would please enter into the chat, um, title and where you work. So we'd really appreciate that as we get to know everybody. And um, while we're waiting for everyone to put their information in the chat, um, we'd also um, like to start with a poll. So let us know what your affiliation is. And Ryan, if you could, um, Get the poll up. If everyone could take some time to fill this out, we'll take a, a few seconds to um, let you all answer the poll. And I'm interested to see how this shakes out. We're hoping to have a good mix of folks from different backgrounds, so we'll see. Are we about ready there, Ryan, you think, with seeing our poll results? Yeah, we have uh, 51 of 61 on the call that have answered. Any last seconds remaining for folks to jump in? <laughs> Otherwise, we can go ahead and pull the poll. And then I think you should be able to pop it up on the screen so we can see how it um, pans out with the results. Margo, you'll be happy to know that I figured out the doorbell. Uh, hey, so <laughs> no more doorbell. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay, so yeah, if we can pull the poll, that'd be great. And are you able to pop up the, oh, there we go. Oh, great. Okay, I have a pretty good mix there. No backyard gardeners, wow. Maybe some of us are, but we also have another role that we play. Um, so that's great. I'm glad to see the, the diversity here in our group. That's what we were hoping for. Um, so next, as we get things started, I'd like to introduce Mr. Colby Hall. He's the executive director for SOAR, and he will get us started with a few remarks. Um, Colby? Awesome. Thanks, Margo. Can everybody hear and, uh, hear and see me okay? Ryan, am I good? You're good to go. Awesome. Well, hey, good morning, everybody. As, as Margo mentioned, I'm Colby Hall, and I'm the executive director here at SOAR. I, I'm really glad that we were able to convene this morning, despite uh, some serious weather challenges over the past couple of weeks. I, I do want to start by saying our, our thoughts are with those communities uh, in, our, in our eastern Kentucky region who have been affected most by the recent flooding. I, I do want to encourage you know everybody that's here today to, to seriously consider making a donation of, of really any amount to the Southeast Kentucky flood relief. Uh, this, this relief fund is being managed by our friends at the Foundation for Appalachian Kentucky and Hannah from the SOAR team I believe uh, is going to share a link to donate in the chat box as well uh, for everybody to consider making any type of, of monetary uh, donation uh, to the relief efforts that are that are going about. So uh, any any help there would be greatly appreciated. I'm not going to take up too much time here because I, I know everybody's you know uh, wanting to listen and learn from the experts. Uh, I just want to quickly say we're we're very fortunate here at SOAR to have you know so many competent, hardworking partners across our 
54 counties. And it's really only with these friends and allies that events like today come together that support all of our work across Appalachia and in Eastern Kentucky. Uh, I'm gonna start just by bragging on those partners and my team a little bit who kind of came together to make this first ever event a reality. Uh, obviously Jennifer and, and her team at the Community Farm Alliance and Amalia and her team from the, the Foundation for a Healthy Kentucky really thanks to you both for working hand in hand with the SOAR team to, to bring this event to fruition. Um, thank you to the speakers who volunteered to, to present and, and speak today. Uh, Mr. Martin Richards, Mrs. Uh, uh, Sabrina McWhorter, Ms. Valerie Ison, Ms. April Sandlin, and Mr. Jason Brashear. I'm definitely looking forward to listening and, and learning from, from all of you. Uh, and to the SOAR team, Margo, Kenny, Hannah, Josh, Sabrina, and Ryan, thank you all so much for the sweat equity you put into today. Uh, without you know any of you, it wouldn't have been possible. I, I definitely think you know uh, one of the things we've learned from the past year or so is the you know virtual events. Uh, the, it's about the same amount of work that goes into putting them together as it is live events. And so uh, there's been a lot of folks working behind the scene to to, to bring this uh, to today. So you know for those of you whom don't know, SOAR is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization formed back in 2013, really mandated to lead Eastern and Appalachia, Kentucky back to prosperity after the collapse of, of the coal industry. And, and our work is, is guided by a strategic blueprint created via input from, from thousands of folks all across our region. And it contains seven specific goals that we believe are critical for the economic revitalization and, re, and revival of the region. You know, goals four and, and five, so goal number four is healthy communities. Uh, number five is regional food systems. Those are probably most directly relevant to the conversation today, um, but they, they feed into every other goal that we have uh, because without healthy, productive Eastern Kentuckians across all age groups and demographics, you know, really our work to revitalize the economy, uh, it, it becomes nearly impossible. You know, we need our people ready to fill the existing jobs that we have available across our region now, and then also ready to fill the new ones that are gonna be available in the future across some emerging industries in our region. And so from the inception of SOAR, you know, we've really worked with and through our strategic partners uh, to focus on disease prevention efforts, but especially when it comes to diabetes. Uh, as Margo's gonna talk about, and I'm sure a lot of folks know, you know our, di our diabetes rate in Appalachia, Kentucky is 17% compared to 11% in non-Appalachian counties in Kentucky. And, it's really alarming and, and it's unacceptable. Um, we know it starts early, right? With us as community leaders and stakeholders, making sure that we stress the, the critical importance of, of proper and balanced diets, healthy foods combined with exercise and, and, and physical activity. Look, you know, I'm from the region and I'm still amazed to go outside and see all the natural outdoor assets that the good Lord blessed us with here. You know, we've got everything we need to transform over time into one of the healthiest, most fit areas, and not just in Kentucky, but across the country. I mean, other communities would kill to have our mountains, our rivers, our lakes, our trails, and our wildlife. So, you know, I think today's really important because it highlights that we as community stakeholders, we've got to take ownership and responsibility for, for coming together to address these disparities that are holding us back. And there's no doubt like that this work and these issues, there's, there's no easy fixes and it, doesn't, it isn't gonna happen overnight, uh, but we have to take action ourselves because nobody else is gonna do this important work but us. So I, I hope folks here today, you know, not only learn something new, which is really, really important, but also that the conversations, presentations and questions really light a fire for somebody for a new idea or strategy for how we move this important work forward together. Um, I'll just say from, from behalf of SOAR, you know, we're here ready to assist and, and help in any way that we can to get this job done. So thanks for listening. It's great to meet everybody. Thank you for being here. We're super excited for today. And uh, Margo, I guess I'll turn it back over to you. Okay. Thanks a lot, Colby. Um, I'll get my screen shared up here again. All right, so as um, Colby mentioned, we're convening the first event of this kind in the region to link local and healthy food partners with our health community partners to try to improve the ability to work together. Um, we wanna build healthy communities. And so health providers, farmers, um, those in the community working together to eat local fresh and healthy foods 
um, and get out more and move around in our beautiful surroundings, as Colby was mentioning. Um, you know, so why are we doing this? You know, we've, I've mentioned all the folks who want to get together. Why are we doing this? So I'll move forward here in my slides. Hopefully that will pop up. I think it takes a minute. Let me know if you see the thumbs up, Ryan, if you see the next slide. Uh, right. Looks like it's uh, stuck on the graphic. So you might have to stop sharing. Right. Okay, I'll stop sharing. I will just have the correct one up there in the first place. Let's see, let me get out of presentation mode. Okay. Oh, my computer is not being a friend right now. It will not get out of presentation mode. Let's see, go back. Oh, darn this thing. All right, well, anyway, I wanted to show slides, but that's not cooperating. Um, so I'll just uh, kind of talk us through it. So um, diabetes is among the top five causes of preventable disease death in Kentucky. So I think Kobe mentioned more than 17% of people in Appalachia, Kentucky counties have been diagnosed with diabetes compared to 11.2% in non-Appalachia counties and even 11.2, that's high. Um, so more than 34 million Americans are living with diabetes. And in 2018 alone, 1.5 million people were newly diagnosed with diabetes. So diabetes is also one of the most expensive chronic conditions um, in the nation, costing over $327 billion annually. One in three Americans or 88 million people have what's known as pre-diabetes. And what's more, more than 84% of those with prediabetes or eight in 10 people don't know they have it. Um, and just to, a little background about diabetes, it's a chronic disease. It affects how your body turns food into energy. And there are three main types. So we have type one diabetes, type two, and gestational diabetes. So what happens when you're, when you're pregnant? So type 1 diabetes is thought to be caused by an autoimmune reaction. The body is basically attacking itself by mistake, and it stops your body from making insulin. So approximately 5 to 10% of people have type 1. With type 2, your body doesn't use insulin well and can't keep your blood sugar at a normal level. So that's what about 90 to 95% of people have is type 2 diabetes. It develops over many years and is usually diagnosed in adults, but more and more, we're seeing it in children and teens and young adults. And if you have type two diabetes, your cells just don't respond normally to insulin. This is called insulin resistance. Um, your pancreas makes more insulin to try to get those cells to do what they need to do, but eventually your pancreas just can't keep up and your blood sugar rises, um, setting the stage for prediabetes and then type two. And then the third type is gestational. So that's what develops in pregnant women who've never had diabetes. And it can put the baby at higher risk of health problems. And also it goes away after the baby is born, but it also increases the mother for type uh, risk of type two diabetes later in life. Um, so that high sugar, that high blood sugar is damaging to the body and it can cause other serious health problems such as heart disease, um, vision loss and kidney disease. And I'll try again, just to see if I can get these slides up here real quick. I don't know why my computer is just not cooperating. Nope, it's still not going to. Okay, it's frozen and I'd have to close out everything and that would take too long. So I just wanna emphasize prediabetes is real. People hear that term all the time, it's real, it's common. And most importantly, it's reversible. So you can prevent or delay prediabetes from developing into type two with simple proven lifestyle changes. Um, that include choosing food for health. And if you're currently a, a diabetic, then you know maintaining healthy food choices is important for the management of your diabetes as well. And so today we'll have several dynamic speakers who will provide an overview of fresh local food programs available in the region, options for taking advantage of our wild food options around us in Appalachia, and you know, getting back to our roots. And then innovative ways that farmers and health providers have teamed up for prescription veggies and efforts to prevent diabetes through a program managed by the Centers for Disease Control. Um, 
we have to make every bite of food we take count. Um, the foods and beverages we choose to consume have a big impact on our health, and we can make better choices by staying focused on nutrient-dense foods and beverages, limiting those with high added sugar, saturated fat, and salt, and then staying within our calorie limits. And um, as, as Colby mentioned, Joe, our region has been hit with several challenges over the past year that make efforts to access healthy foods and to get out and um, do activities that we enjoy, it made it a bit more challenging. Um, with the pandemic impacting every aspect of our life and then facing these back-to-back -back winter storms that we had, and now just this week, uh, more weather-related disaster with the flooding. Um, so we'd like to get an idea of how the recent flooding has impacted health and agriculture. So let's do another poll real quick, inquiring about what happened um, after the week that we had of, of flooding. So Ryan, if you could do the next poll. So we have two questions there, one about how the floods might have impacted farms in the region, and then the impact floods had on people with um, diabetes. We'll leave that up for about 30 seconds or so to give folks a chance to look through and click their responses. All right, do we have some, someone's having trouble where it won't submit. Are we getting the answers in, Ryan? Are most folks getting their answers in? Uh, we have 47 of 67 so far. Okay, well, let's go ahead and pull it so we can get moving. We're just a little tad behind schedule. Okay, so yeah, a lot of damaged equipment from those floods. Um, I'm glad to see no one's heard of loss of the animals, but we did have folks lose their crops um, and, and others may not, may not know. And then from the health side, um, access to health cutoff, um, some loss of insulin or medications, um, stores where they need to get products hindered. So kind of across the board there a little bit with, with how it impacted health. But um, needless to say, the flood did impact us from both of those um, points of view, whether it's the agriculture farm food side or the health and our, and our medications. Um, so thank you for sharing that. And, and please do, as Colby mentioned, help out if you can and share that link to donate to those who have been impacted by the flood. Um, so let's move on now to the main part of our program. And um, I don't know, Ryan, if you have the agenda up, if you could pop it up since my screen has decided my my uh, PowerPoint has frozen and won't get it. It's just gonna pop up the, the agenda there. Um, but we'll hear from five experts in our region who work either on the food side or the health side. And we're grateful for them for sharing their insights with us today. And then after the speakers, we'll have an opportunity to join two different breakout rooms. And we hope everyone sticks around for that opportunity because that's where we're going to be discussing things in a little more detail and we'll get to hear a lot more um, from you as we open open up that's that forum for discussion. So first, I would like to introduce um, our first speaker, Mr. Martin Richards. He's the executive director of Community Farm Alliance, and he's going to um, give us a regional overview. And then Ryan, as Mr. Richards gets set up, let's get an idea of um, any barriers that may exist to access accessing food. We'll pop up another poll while Mr. Richards gets going. If you have any barriers to accessing food, let us know, and then we'll get started with Mr. Richards. Ryan, you give me the go ahead. All right, well, let's get, can you pull up the poll results real quick? Yeah, it looks like we've still got about 30 people to, to get their answers in. We've got 34 of 68. All right, maybe like 10 more seconds. Mm -hmm. Hurry up and answer. <laughs> 42, 67. Okay, here we go. Okay, all right. I think we're good. All righty, let's pull it. Ready? 
Great. Okay, Price. That's a big one, the top answer. Yeah. All right, well, very interesting. All right, well, Mr. Richards, if you want to um, get us started, thank you for joining. Yes, can you see my screen? Yep. All right, I'm going to start off with a little video. Um, I hope the audio comes through for you all. You heard the, I hope you could hear the audio. It was just music, but anyway. Um, now. All right. I hope everybody can see my slides. Um, anyway, thank you uh, for this opportunity. Thanks for all the partners, um, you know, SOAR and, and everybody else on this. Um, and um, I am looking forward to the to the dynamic speakers that Margo referenced, but before you get to them, you've got to deal with me. So um, anyway, a little bit this, uh, a little bit about uh, the overall landscape, um, you know, in Appalachia. So, you know, maybe needless to say, we have high insecurity rates um, in Appalachia. So, you know, this was taken from a 2016 um, report that the Appalachian Funders Network did. Um, I like to think that since that time we've made progress and I think we have until we hit 2020. And um, then we took a huge step backwards. Um, I don't think anybody knows what the numbers are yet, um, but I'm sure they're, they're not going to look good. Um, and this is, I think, especially true for Kentucky um, and West Virginia, right? The, uh, about the food insecurity rates. Um, but that also kind of goes hand in hand with the ability to access food and especially the ability to access healthy food. So for as big a geographic area as Eastern Kentucky uh, in the ARC counties are, is we have a very small number of stores um, who are actually accepting WIC or, or, uh, or SNAP. Um, and that makes it really challenging um, for folks. And of course, we know that geography and distance is a part of that. Um, and, but, you know, there's uh, a lot in play here. On the, on the good side of things is um, that over the last decade, that we have seen in local food system development a, a lot of good good news. And so this is from our friends at the Central Appalachian Network um, that have been tracking this, uh, you know, the, the rise and the growth of local food systems um, in the region. The other good thing is um, Appalachians are innovators. Um, I'm not gonna, I'm not trying to steal any of Val's thunder, but for example, you know, let your county farmers market, right? I mean, I think it astounded us all that they became the first farmer's market that was also a summer feeding site in Kentucky. And even more astounding, the third in the whole country uh, to, to be part of this. And I think it's an example of what happens when communities get that support and the flexibility to innovate. And we see that all the time. Um, back in 2018, as CFA was preparing for um, uh, ARC power proposal around 
access to healthy food. We did, I think, the first scan of Appalachia to see what is going on out there. Um, so we were able to identify um, 30 different um, food access programs or projects um, that basically fall into these seven categories. And I am absolutely sure that we did not capture all of them. Um, and since, since 2018, that there others have, um, have emerged too. So here in Kentucky, big picture wise, there's a lot of, a lot of things happening. Um, and even in each one of these blue things, there are innovations happening, like the summer feeding program, you know, that I mentioned with Letcher County, but that extends to Grow Appalachia and uh, Berea Kids Eats um, that started as summer feeding and included, you know, a lot of, uh, of local source. And that has been critical uh, in this pandemic with schools closing. They have continued that program on and is continuing right now. Because we all know, right, that for a lot of kids, um, they depend on schools for breakfast and for lunch and often through backpack programs. And when they cannot get to school, that means we have hungry kids. Um, for CFA, we run two programs uh, related to food access, Kentucky Double Dollars and the Fresh RX for Moms. That is um, a prescription program that grew out of the pharmacy program that I'm sure Val is going to talk about. Um, and that is a vegetable prescription program for mothers on Medicaid. Um, we piloted that in Bowling Green uh, Community Farmers Market. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to say that this year it's expanding other markets, including Perry County Farmers Market. Um, so that's exciting. But I want to go into double dollars um, as an example of, of what the impact can be. So the Double Dollars program started in six Eastern Kentucky farmers markets. Again, the innovation there, um, and then expanded in 2015. You can see the, the growth that, that that program is starting to expand. And now we have in 2019, 2020, just the continued growth. We don't have our map yet for what 2021 looks like, but um, I, the growth continues. So for double dollars is actually four incentive programs that double up um, folks who use their SNAP benefits, um, but also for their WIC and senior farmers market nutrition benefits. Um, and we also include uh, SNAP related proteins uh, at farmers markets. And again, you can see the growth um, that is happening. And it will be obviously 2021 will be um, even greater. <clears throat> While this program has been primarily at farmers markets and pop-up markets uh, we call fresh stops, um, we've also been piloting it at retail locations because retail is a completely different animal than it, when it comes to these kind of programs and farmers markets. Um, but we also know that that is where most SNAP uh, beneficiaries spend their dollars. So we're trying to figure that out. Um, including this past year in 2020 um, at the Manchester IGA. And that was, um, was successful enough, even in a pandemic, um, that we're looking forward to expanding that to um, several other IGAs in East Kentucky this year. So uh, one of the things is about the, the, for CFA, we've been saying for, uh, geez, about 25 years that uh, local food system development is economic development. And for the last five or six years, um, the Kentucky Ag Development Fund has invested in the double dollars program. And so we've been tracking like, what is the return on that investment of public dollars? And this is an example of it, including um, working with the University of Kentucky Community Economic Development Initiative of Kentucky, CEDIC, I hope a lot of people know who that is. Who, who is doing this analysis for us. And so, you know, they are coming up with what is the economic impact of this investment. And it's encouraging. In fact, I think that it is one of the, the best returns on investment uh, for, for master tobacco settlement farms, uh, funds to date. Um, so again, you know, the, that this in fact is economic development. Our next step is to, and that has been accepted, right? And in fact, the mayor of Louisville, um, Greg Frischer, when he first ran, he one of his platform planks was increasing access to, to local food. So it is a given now. 
um, our next goal is that improving food access is also economic development. And a number of studies have shown that, in fact, SNAP benefits are one of the best economic development tools um, that we have in our arsenal. So when it comes to incentives, you know, there's a couple, a couple assumptions we have to we have to overcome. So one, when a SNAP customer goes into a retail outlet, that they, they're gonna spend one of their SNAP dollars, and then they're also gonna spend an additional dollar. So when you include incentives in that mix, it is not substituting that cash. Um, it is in fact, they do spend that incentive dollar, but they continue to spend that, that extra cash. So another 30 cents on that. What does that mean? That means the retail actually sees an increase in sales um, by having these incentives available. But it also gives uh, SNAP folks another 70 cents in discretionary funding that they didn't have. And again, they're gonna spend that in their local communities in a lot of number of ways. So it means that the economic benefit is translated to the whole community. The next, next goal here is again, connecting that improving public health, and for us specifically through healthy food access, is also economic development. And we, while we don't have the great numbers um, yet, we have some of these, and that, again, this is from a Harvard wellness study that is a decade old. But in fact, that we improve people's health, that it does translate to um, a better return um, on investment. And I would like to say that, you know, that is one reason why our partners um, with Well Care and Passport, um, I, mean, I think I saw Lisa's name from Passport on here, why they support this program and why they continue to support that program is because, you know, it, it is much more effective to invest upfront in improving access to good food than it is on the back end to, um, to medic, um, medical care. So, there's a lot of good things happening, um, and they're often happening kind of, you know, in one community and the next community. Um, but if we don't take a systematic approach to this, then that's what's going to happen. It's just going to be some communities benefit and others don't. And that's where, where policy comes into play um, so that, that what one community can benefit from is, is accessible to all communities. And so this is, this is Communities Farm Alliance theory of change. And I think that kind of illustrates the way we work that we rely on our members and their communities to identify uh, the issues and the problems. And guess what? They often have a really good idea of how to, how to solve those. Um, and again, Lecture County is a prime example of that. And the Community Farm Alliance then helps take those good ideas, scale them up, create model projects and programs like Double Dollars, um, and then build the alliances that ultimately get to the public policy piece that provide that benefit across the board for everybody. So a couple of the things that I'm trying to get across today is that for these programs, um, that we need to in, increase like SNAP beneficiaries um, to participate um, and spend their SNAP benefits at farmers markets, um, at retail locations, because it is good. It is federal dollars that are coming into our state and we need to get them to circulate. Um, we also need to align our, our state, um, state and local policies on agriculture along with food and health um, they are not well aligned, but we're making improvements on that. We also need to come overcome isolation, whether it's going across the county line or it's going across the um, east, uh, west of I-75 or it's across state lines. Um, we have to all work together to make this happen. And when we do that, then ultimately we realize that in fact health, good health is, is also economic development. And again, I think that leads to increased investment um, from government, philanthropy um, at both the state, local and federal levels. Um, so some great opportunities uh, for us here. So from a collaborative point of view, uh, Community Farm Alliance and, and many other folks I think on here are familiar with the Central Appalachian Network. Um, the CAN has a food and ag uh, systems working group and that is scattered over, you know, the central Appalachia, the states in central Appalachia. 
It is a peer-to-peer -peer learning network that folks get to share what is working well. Um, and it is a group effort to uh, build up the funding and resources support that then can uh, be applicable across the region. Here in Kentucky, um, we had the Kentucky Food Policy Network. Um, it went on hiatus for a while, but I'm happy to say that has reemerged um, this fall as the Kentucky Food Action Network. CFA is one of the anchor organizations for that Kentucky network. Um, and we have four working groups that are meeting monthly. Um, those are the four working groups. And you can see that we're that and it is a wide variety of stakeholders in the food system um, who, are, who are working at identifying, again, policies, programs, projects um, that, that can be scaled up um, and making these connections. So there are a lot of opportunities for policy development. Um, guess what? The next Farm Bill is coming up in just a couple of years. And the Farm Bill, three quarters of the Farm Bill is around um, food nutrition programs, but it is also marries agriculture into it. Um, and so the federal efforts have recognized for a long time these connections between these two. I think the other effort, and certainly in my conversations and work with uh, like the MCOs, Passport and Well Care, is one of the goals is to get the Medicare Medicaid system to recognize that utilizing those benefits up front for increasing food access in turn um, reduces the back end of the, the medical expenses for um, uh, associated with those programs. And then on the state level, um, you know, hunger has been a problem in Kentucky. Um, and a lot of us in Kentucky consider Kentucky an agricultural state. So the idea that we're hungry in Kentucky is kind of appalling. Um, and then of course, COVID, right, really drove home the situation. Um, but it also highlighted that, um, and I could, I could spend another half hour talking about uh, Kentucky's response to COVID, but we need a blueprint for ending hunger in this state. And that blueprint has to include both charitable aspects, but market-based asset, uh, market-based approaches too, because neither one of those can do it alone. It has to be this combination. Um, and that leads to, again, you know, the idea of Kentucky having, creating its own farm bill that marries all these policy efforts around food, agriculture, and health. Um, and CFA right now is working on creating the Kentucky Healthy Farm and Food Incentive Fund. So the USDA has a number of programs that really can help um, in these areas of healthy food access, but all these USDA programs require a 50% match. And that can be a real challenge, um, especially for folks in the nonprofit area coming up with that match. And so, you know, getting the state to uh, set aside funds that can be utilized to, to meet those federal matches and, and prevent Kentucky from leaving a whole lot of money on the table. And then at the local level, I mean, there's a lot that folks can do. So supporting farmers market operations, whether it's a city government or county government, um, recognizing how important this work is, including permanent uh, structures. And we have made a lot of progress, but you know, moving from half a dozen pickup trucks in a parking lot on a Saturday to having a permanent structure that people can come regardless of the weather and come all year round. And then one way to do that is for, uh, again, counties or communities setting up a local food policy council that brings all the local stakeholders in, in the food system together to talk and share and move forward. And then there are, you know, again, opportunities for philanthropy. Um, we still need substantial investment in the research aspect. Of, of impacts, what metrics to uh, measure and, and how we evaluate those that allows us to move, move forward in, um, in the best way possible and utilize the resources. Um, and again, I mentioned federal matching funds, but there's also at the state level uh, a requirement for matching funds too. Um, and then again, at the community level, um, providing support for those communities to again innovate, um, have the flexibility um, to do that. So I want to acknowledge here that all this work, um, 
CFA and everybody else, we're, we don't do it alone, right? I mean, the folks um, from philanthropy, from government, um, you know, play a huge role. And I think a lot of folks on this call um, also are working with these folks. And um, so it, we all are in this together and, you know, uh, and I appreciate the help. And that's it for me. Um, I don't know if we have time for um, any questions or move it on, but I'll turn it back over to Margo. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Richards. Thank you for that thorough overview of all the things that are happening. A lot of, of good networks out there already and efforts in place. Um, I think we have a couple minutes um, and I forgot to mention at the beginning, but yeah, if you have any questions, please pop them in the chat. Um, and I'm not sure, Hannah, did you see any questions pop up yet? Or um, so far, we have any examples of local food policy councils in Kentucky? Um, yes, there have been examples, um, and they're, they're, they're kind of different. Sometimes they're not called full food policy councils. So for a while, Louisville had one, um, you know, and with change in administrations and so forth, I, it no longer exists. But um, other places, they're often facilitated by health departments. So Barron River Health District um, uh, supported the equivalent of a food policy council for a number of years. I don't know if it's still going on um, down there. Um, Berea uh, has one kind of the conversation has continued, um, but it doesn't have an organized food policy council. Um, so it's going to look different, um, you know, community by community. Um, so, yeah, no, I can't say yes, exactly. I, although I say, I think there are some in Northern Kentucky. Great, thank you. Any other questions, Hannah? Nope, not so far. Uh, someone wants to know, will these slides be available after today's presentation? And we can probably coordinate that, can't we, Margo? Yes, and <clears throat> I should have mentioned, <clears throat> excuse me, as well that the event is being recorded and we're gonna, um, post that up on the SOAR website. That's right, Hannah. Yeah, it'll be on our YouTube channel, so we can send out our YouTube one. channel. Okay, so we can send out the link to this event. So you can sc um, scroll through any of, of the talks and presentations. Um, and then we can also work on emailing everybody who registered um, the materials at, after the presentation today. Thank you. Um, but that's it for questions. Okay, well, thank you so much, Mr. Richards. Really appreciate that. Um, and then to um, keep in the interest of time, I think let's move along. We'll switch gears a little bit and talk about Eating Wild um, Appalachia. And we have Mrs. Sabrina uh, McWhorter and she is the creator of Eat Wild Appalachia. So Sabrina, if you wanna kick us off with the next one. Let me see if I can get this shared. All right, can everybody see that? Yep, you're good to go. Okay, perfect. So good morning, everybody. Before I begin, I'd like to thank Margo and Colby and the SOAR team for inviting me to present today. My name is Sabrina McCorder and I'm the creator of Eat Wild Appalachia. So from a young age, I've always loved creating things. I remember making peanut butter and jelly sandwich crackers in Mr. and Mrs. Horn's kitchen as a young girl and who would have thought that that would actually be a thing 15 years later. Nowadays, we get caught up, there we go, sorry, there we go. Nowadays, we get so caught up in the hustle of life and glorify being busy, but there is something so pure and honest in the slow work of cooking. I want you to close your eyes for a minute and think about the earliest childhood, childhood memory that you have. Have you got it? What do you smell? So for me, it's peach cobbler. I can vividly picture my mom baking this and smell it as if it were right here in front of me today. Isn't it amazing how our senses work? But more than the smell, I can remember the feeling. I felt safe, loved, and seen. Those are very important feelings to experience, especially as a child. And I believe it's important to make everybody feel that way. Everyone deserves to. And what better way than through food? I believe wholeheartedly that most problems can be solved in the kitchen. So when Margo invited me to participate today, I didn't share this with her, but I was so excited to present about something so passionate to me, but also something that is so close to my heart. I actually lost my granny to diabetes when I was 14 years old. And I think often about what if I were older 
if I had known more, if I could have changed something, but you can't live in the past and you just must charge forward and help shape the future. I love this quote by Ann Wigmore, the food you eat can be the, either the safest and most powerful form of medicine or the slowest form of poison. So why is living off the land and knowing where your food comes from so important to me? My food, why do I, why is it important to me? Why do I cook from scratch and tend to a garden, prep and preserve, forage the wilds and raise my own awareness of options? My wives go hand in hand. If you can see there, I've got a few pictures of my beautiful children. You can't pour from an empty cup. First and foremost, you have to take care of your own health. And you certainly can't care for your family if you're sick or worse. Hunting and gathering provides so many bonus benefits. When you feel good, you're ready to tackle life. You get that carefree spirit about you. You get to live, simply to live. Free to live, play, minimize your stress, your worry. It can be freedom from food insecurity, freedom to watch your children grow up, to care for your elders, to finally be able to tighten those purse strings and save money that we all have so much trouble doing. You have an opportunity to teach your children the simple life and set them out on the right foot with a clean slate. And of course, one simple bonus is the taste. If you're like me, I can't wait for those tasty garden tomatoes you see in the pictures. I am ready for summer. So gone are the days of healthy tasting like cardboard. When you eat healthy, you get to taste the rainbow. So what do you need? to get started. It's honestly so simple. Any weather, lots of water, move your body, explore, play, learn, and I can't stress this enough, include your children. It is so important for them and it's important for you. And what better way than to do it as a family? So let's talk foraging. Kentucky provides loads of foraging goodness from simple things like dandelions and chickweeds and violets to more elusive items like morels and pawpaws those things we all search for every single year. Foraging is both fun and challenging. Some key things to note though, is do not ever, please, do not ever eat anything without, if you are not 100%, without a shadow of a doubt, correctly identified it. Nature can be tricky. Often the lookalikes are near the real deal and guys, some of these things can be deadly. So invest in a couple of good field guides and please do not use a phone app. They're often correct, but often they are not. And seriously, no joking around here, it could be deadly and you don't want that for your family or yourself. So why take the risk? Foraging is both tasty and free. From a foodie like me, it provides exotic materials at a low cost. It provides me to feel close to my heritage. It challenges me and it is something that we get to do as a family. The outdoors burn off calories and attitudes. And that is a fact. <laughs> so now let's dive deep into the hunting overview. I cannot stress enough how important it is to know the laws. The moment that you decide you want to hunt or fish, you're accepting a responsibility to also help govern and respect the land. The age old tradition that our ancestors used to survive is crucial for our future. And it is so important to keep that tradition as well as educate the next generation. How many stories do you hear about every single year about a wildlife accident? I can't speak for all of them and I'm no expert, but I could imagine about 90% of them could have been avoided had they had respect and care for Mother Nature. Gone is that mentality of if it's brown, it's down. Now we are stewards of the land, respect it, care for it, nurture it, and you will be rewarded tenfold. And again, I cannot stress enough, please involve your children. So let's talk about some of the facts. Cut the waste. So U.S. families throw out between 14 and 25 percent of food and beverages they buy. This can cost the average family between $1,365 to $2,275 annually. That's, that's a lot of money. So one of the big things that is important for me is to recycle, reuse, and repurpose. That is the whole point behind the show in collaboration with the neighborhood in Ashland and River City Harvest. We simply make a meal, flip the dish, and then multiply the meal. We try to make it as cost efficient as possible. And we want to show families you can eat great, that meal can stretch, and you're not going to be spending very much money. So dining in, this one was a shocker. The average American spends $232 per month eating meals outside the home. That's American. If you're a family of four, that is a whole lot of dough. 
it is absolutely mind boggling to me that we you that we personally used to do this. We were guilty of it ourselves. And just like anything in life, if it's important to you, you'll find a way. And if not, you'll find an excuse. So security. In 2019, 13.6% of ho households with children were food insecure. That number should be zero. This is a driving factor for my passion to help others. I saw this firsthand when I was in Romania on a mission trip and I saw humans and dogs in the dumpsters together digging for food. Guys, that's not acceptable, acceptable there and it's certainly not acceptable here. Remember that food waste pack? Do you see where I'm going with this? So frugal living. In 2019, food spending by U.S. consumer businesses and government entities totaled $1.77 trillion. Food away from home accounted for 54.8% of food expenditures, up from 50.1% in 2009. I would almost be scared to see the newest uh, updates of that. The more that you save, the more that you have to offer. Not only does this help provide financial freedom for your personal use, but once you free up some of that cash for yourself, you're able to be more generous with your resources to other people. Hey, Sabrina, okay. yeah. can we pull can we pull up the poll that you had about? Um, oh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. I was supposed to do that at the beginning, everyone, but I, I slipped up on the job. Thank you, Ryan, for popping that up. It ties in with our economics uh, information there. So if we could all just quickly guesstimate how much we spend. Maybe give us a few more seconds. And I think the pandemic, if, if anything, it's shown us how much we did spend eating out and maybe has gotten us to be a little more frugal um, during these times. Okay. Yeah, one of the greatest okay. things about COVID, if there's, you know, it's hard to say it that way, but one good thing is it's brought a lot of awareness to people um, for family, food, everything. We're at about 56 that have responded, Marga. Great. Yeah, let's pull it and just see. And then, sorry to interrupt you, Sabrina. I just no, you're interrupt. fine. I didn't want to miss getting that info. Okay, great. Yeah. So, almost. What are the results, points. Margo? I can't see them. Oh, yeah. So, we've got the, the number one answer is between $300 and $400. And, and the second top answer is over $400 a month. Wow. Wow. <laughs> That's, I expected that, but still, it just. It breaks my heart. <laughs> so, all right, are we good to go? Yes, go ahead. Okay, so take a minute to look at this picture. Can anyone else actually feel this picture? Close your eyes for a moment and picture yourself as this individual. That wind in your hair, your chest rose to the sky, your head back breathing in life with all that it has to offer. It is such a peaceful feeling. Now, look at this. this, this fact here. Heart disease is the leading cause of death for both men and women in the United States. If you have diabetes, you're twice as likely to have heart disease or a stroke than someone who doesn't have diabetes. And at a younger age, and at a younger age, the longer you have diabetes, the more likely you are to have heart disease. I don't know about you guys, but I would rather be the person on the left. And as someone who has diabetes and heart disease both running rampantly through their family, I don't want to be another statistic. So this is where it comes in. You have to make that decision. It's not going to be easy. Um, nothing worth having is, but it is so worth it. Just when you're when you're really struggling, picture this person again, breathe in that moment, think about it, and then make your decision. And maybe it'll clear it up a little bit for you. So before we move on, I do want to say, again, I am no doctor. Educate yourself, um, do the studies, re research. These are just my personal opinions. So let's take them as that. <laughs> but dandelions. So this is, you know, that weed that everybody hates mostly. But if you think about it, the possibilities are endless. And so I've got a couple of facts here and I have included the links below in case anybody wants to go look at them. But in traditional Chinese and Native American medicine, Dandelion root has been used to treat stomach and liver conditions. Herbalists today believe that it can aid in many ailments, including acne, eczema, high cholesterol, heart, heartburn, uh, gastrointestinal disorders, diabetes, and even cancer. Um, so again, not a doctor. These are just other people's thoughts, but 
Um, this here on, on the picture is some fried dandelion blossoms. They're so much fun. Um, you can bake them as well to make them more healthy. We actually fried these in sunflower oil. So again, it's a, it's a better fat to use than your plain old vegetable oil. Um, but just make it fun. Again, include those kiddos. Do you know how much fun my, at the time, four-year-old had putting that big glop of Chipotle mayo on it and smacking it like a, a paint and then getting to create a picture? That's the thing is you have to create your, um, create the fun in the kitchen. So next up we have sweet violets. And so this is just really fun to add a little color to your plate. A study compared violet leaf vitamin C content to that of oranges and vitamin A content to that of spinach. From the basil leaves, if it were collected in spring, this early research reported that violets contain twice as much vitamin C as the same weight of orange and more than twice the amount of vitamin A gram for gram when compared with spinach. That is crazy. <laughs> and it is so much fun to just explore and try out recipes. This is a wildflower yogurt bar. Kids love to do this. We throw in some chocolate chips because why not? Everything is fun in moderation. Next up, we have the elusive morel mushrooms. So again, morel mushrooms carry the highest amount of vitamin D among the edible mushrooms. And it is 34% of our daily required levels of vitamin D, which we all know during all of this is so important in 100 grams of raw morels. Now, this is a pre-baked pizza. I did not eat this one raw, but you can eat raw uh, mushrooms all the time. A really easy way to throw them in is with pesto. But this pizza, y'all, words do not do it justice. You will be scouring the woods even more for morel, rush, for morel mushrooms after you try this. Next up, we have fish tacos. And so fish, of course, is one of those things that all doctors recommend you have more of. It's filled with omega-3 fatty acids, vitamins such as D and B2. It has rich in calcium, phosphorus, and a great source of minerals such as iron, zinc, iodine, magnesium, and potassium. And the American Heart Association recommends eating fish at least two times per week as part of a healthy diet. Grilled, baked, fried, they're a staple in our household. We are obsessed with them. Um, and Kentucky has so many delicious fish to offer. Next up. We have pheasant two ways. So this is pheasant with dried saddle mushrooms or also called uh, pheasant back mushrooms. And pheasant, the, the bird pheasant has more protein, less fat and less cholesterol than chicken, turkey, mallard and beef. And then pheasant back mushrooms are high in antioxidants, which most mushrooms are. And this particular mushroom makes an incredible broth that you will just crave all year long. And it's a great mushroom to dehydrate and repurpose. So ducks, I have to warn you guys, if you or your husband or your significant other are hunters and you dabble in the waterfowl world, it's over. Uh, it becomes a new addiction. And I have to, you know, probably go get my own deer at this point because waterfowling has taken over our life. But if you try a duck hopper, you will understand, you will love it, you'll be obsessed and you'll want all the ducks in your freezer. So duck meat is an excellent source of iron, providing 50% of iron we need in a day, which is crazy and justifies my need to have them every week. <laughs> Next up is steered goose filet. And so this is hands down um, my favorite wild game. And this is kind of a funny, this is, I'm pointing at the screen, like you can see me pointing. So uh, the top two are duck and goose. So as I named this dish, duck, duck, goose, you know, because I have children and it's just funny that way. But uh, the bottom there is that steered goose. It is a source of vitamin B, A, and E, and minerals with potassium, phosphorus, magnesium, iron, and zinc, and it goes perfectly with a homemade horseradish sauce that I can hook you up with. Next, with turkey season coming up, guys, we'll be counting down the days after you have turkey schnitzel. Uh, the best health benefit of eating turkey meat is how low glycemic index, and therefore you can help keep your insulin levels stable, which of course very important for this conversation, but for everyone in general, um, you can bake or fry this. We actually bake it um, and you can still achieve that perfect golden crust when you bake it and it's even as crispy. And so this one is perfectly served with lemon, although it's not pictures, so I apologize for that. So let's connect. Here are a couple ways that you can connect with me. So I'm on Pinterest, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. And then you can always visit the website 
Um, that's where I do my more in-depth tutorials. Feel free to call or email me. I'm an open book. I want to help everyone with all of their questions. Um, and something really cool, if I'm able to do this, I do have a free ebook with some simple kitchen garden plans, top five items to forage this spring, and a new recipe that I'd like to send out to everybody, um, as well as a challenge of three things to do today to change your health. So let's chat if we have a few moments. Um, that's it for me. Thank you. So much, Sabrina, that was awesome. And I think some of the comments I've seen are that you're making everyone hungry um, <laughs> and definitely want the book. So um, yeah, Hannah, were there any questions that popped up? Not yet. If anybody has any questions, pop them in the chat box and we will ask Sabrina. So while we're waiting, I'll just point out what we have here. So the top left is a dandelion green salad. Um, it is divine. I cannot wait for dandelions to be back because they're so good. Um, bottom left is stuffed zucchini and squash blossoms. Then we have violets. That is such a fun experiment with your children. If you can see the picture right next to it, the different colors, all of the color changes from the acidity that you add to it. So the more lemon juice you add, the pinker it gets. I have a little girl, so of course we had to go hot pink. Um, and then again, under the, the four jars there is the pheasant back or dried saddle mushroom. And then we have hibiscus flower, which is edible. Most people didn't know. Um, I have a, a really pretty um, ricotta bread that has that. I wish I would put a picture on here now. And then of course, just some dandelions. So let me stop screen sharing if I can. There we go. All right. Although I don't see questions except people wanting to um, um, get the book that you're, you mentioned. And so I think that's great. And some are popping into the, the chat, the three things they're gonna do. Um, um, thank you all so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Can't wait to hear from the other speakers. Um, you're welcome. Um, thank you for um, participating. I think this was great to share some of what's out there that we can all look for. I know I tried your, um, I don't know how heart healthy it is or diabetes friendly, but I did make the syrup from the, <laughs> the violet blossoms. <laughs> Probably not the best um, for diabetes discussion, but uh, everything in moderation, as she said. So, um, you know, we can have those little treats um, treats now and then. And I put my top three things, get outside, move. That's what I'm going to do today. <laughs> I need to get out and stop sitting at the Zoom so much. Um, and you inspired me. I want to see your book. I want to get my garden plan um, set up and really start foraging more. I've only foraged in my backyard now, so I want to get out into the woods behind us <laughs> and look for some of those really good things. Um, the great thing about foraging is it can be done socially distanced, so that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Well, thank you so much, um, Sabrina. Really appreciate uh, you joining us and all right so let's um oh, oh we real, real quick sabrina, sabrina yeah. somebody wants to know do you host foraging classes i haven't just because i started really um exploring this more publicly last year during covid um but i do have a connection with someone in the red river gorge that they're talking about doing some some foraging classes um just shoot me an email and we can make something happen i'm always open to helping and I believe the Ag Extension does that. Um, I've seen some of those um, through um, Facebook and other things where they're advertised, either state parks or um, sometimes Ag Extension. So um, definitely would like to learn more about that. All right, well, um, next up, I'd like to pop up um, our next poll question. Um, Brian, if you have that one ready um, about anybody with experience with the veggie prescription programs. And our next speaker is um, Valerie Eisen, who is the director of the Cowan Creek Community Center. So as Valerie um, gets set up and comes on to speak, we'll finish up this poll. And I hope I've gotten your name right, Valerie. I've actually never heard it said. I, I've only seen it spelled. <laughs> You did. Oh, great. 
Okay, how's the poll, Ryan? Looks like we have about 32 that have responded so far. Okay, quick folks, <laughs> get your answers in. All right, I guess let's go ahead and pull it so we can get moving. Okay, a lot of I don't know anything about this program. So, all right, well, that's perfect then. Um, so um, Valerie can share with us a little bit about the pharmacy program. Thank you, Valerie. Um, are we seeing the screen now? Uh, not right now, we were before the Okay, let's go back. So hello, I am Valerie Horn, and Valerie Eisenhorn, and it's always a, a pleasure to have be recognized that way also. I'm very happy to be here. How about now, do we see it now? No. Nope. I'm not seeing it at the moment, Valerie. Okay, all right. Okay, so I am struggling. I can share your slides for you if you prefer that way. Whichever can happen fastest, Ryan. Okay, give me just a moment. I'll get yours ready for you. Do we see it now? Yes. Yep. Yes. So still click from the beginning at the top okay. left. Okay. I'm so sorry, y'all. Technology is not my best, but I'm so happy to be here. Big sigh of relief. Thank you, Soar. Thank you, Martin Richards, for all of the experience in getting here. Healthy Foundation, and I'm going to make up that time we lost. So uh, I am Valerie, and this is uh, different things that I am involved with in our community. And it's a pretty, pretty um, extensive effort that touches a lot of different people. And I'm happy to represent them today. Uh, like many of you, I'm from a rural community. So this is a photo thanks to Martin Richards and Letcher County suffers some, um, as many here do, some pretty poor um, wealth inequities with that. And also health inequities. There's about one in three who have diabetes in our community. And that is a significant issue. So, uh, and you can see how Letcher County fares with Kentucky, just a little bit ahead of the curve there. Um, I put this one in and uh, last night thought I was uh, thinking about the years per mile that I've done this presentation before in central Kentucky. And when I leave central Kentucky and make my way back to Whitesburg, you lose uh, three to five years. And, and I know it's not that simple, but um, as a grandmother here, which Sabrina motivated me to get with my children and get in the garden and get in the kitchen, that matters. And we want to change those, those numbers and stretch that life out and let it be healthier and better. And that's one of, the, one of the ways that that began and that they we're hitting that is with a partnership with MCHC and the pharmacy program. And that came about when I was working with Community Farm Alliance um, and had heard, been, been able to hear about it happening in other places. So had a relationship already with MCHC and it began with simple just t-shirts and we just continued to grow that with the summer food service program support and then the veggie prescription program which began in 2014. So this is this is this was the beginning of that CFA was there for that MCHC is the financial funder we had uh, input and buy-in as Martin said earlier from passport, well care, um, and, and who recognize the value and the win of that. So um, that's my garden there. 
Um, and what does it take? The what does the farmers market responsibilities and what are MCHCs, the uh, medical care providers, is to communicate with the market. What this is what MCHC does in this program. They identify and recruit recruit patients, obtain health measurements. We've been fortunate that they've procured the funding. This will be about our sixth year and work with the patients and uh, report to funders and connect and support the growers also. So that is what their responsibilities are is, and then our responsibilities are to understand, understand the goals of the, um, of the care provider recognize that what what needs they have and work to meet them also we've got to get the growers at the farmers market we need to get the grower support a challenge is meeting supply and demand initially we really struggled with that and to make that happen we need to interact with patients you can see uh jim murtaugh a um, uh, market manager who talks with the patients they came in early uh, of the mornings to make sure that they would get the best produce. And so you have to make special accommodations to see that there's places to sit, that there's shade, that there's water. Um, we have to keep and maintain financial reports to be able to share with, uh, with the funders and with, uh, we give a lot of, shared a lot of information with CF, CFA. And then we have to be able to reimburse the growers and, and keep them um, up with that. In the beginning, we reimburse the growers at the end of each market. We don't do that now. Um, they will they will sell and do incentive programs like on a Saturday, and we do the checks on uh, Monday and they get them on Tuesday. And it really does come down to relationships and just building those throughout the community and not taking either, either for granted, recognize that, um, that everybody has their, has their place and their value. So when the farmer's market begins in what I think was unique and successful about it here is it began in the doctor's office or in the medical care provider's office. It was not a program that you signed up for, but the doctor really prescribed that. Um, State Representative Angie Hatton did a, a nice article with uh, CFA on zucchini as a prescription. So they would get a prescription, bring it to the market, get coins, and then shop at the market for what they needed. Value of doing that is that they got to see the farmer uh, talk about recipes, where it was grown, have choice, and, and we felt like lots of dignity and um, respect with this program. So um, this is this is how a market would, would look. You'll hear from uh, Lauren here later, that's in the front. Um, a little bit on our market sales. Um, and we've been keeping data since 2013 to 2020. Um, the market sales total in 2013 were about 6,000. This year we dropped down with some of the impacts of COVID to 94,000, but our high year was 122,000 in market sales. And I also say that with a little bit of caveat that farmers do not always report their cash sales. So um, we, we suspect it's higher than that. And the pharmacy program, that was a huge, huge difference in sales for the market and the farmers that came in with that. So you can see the investment that MCHC has made in this program over the years that it's been here. The first year in 2015, I asked for, we, we began with a $5,000 ask and that was gone within like two weeks. We thought we might do 20 families and $5,000. It was gone quickly and we grew that and other people wanted to participate in that. So um, that's a level of the, of the investment that we made there. We also have the UK walking program. We'll talk a little bit about that and double dollars. But access is a key to the market that um, that, that fresh food and vegetables will be available for the community who, who need it, who need it most. 
Um, this is, I sent this to Martin actually in 2017. Let's see if this works. This was, this was the market uh, opening morning of the market on 2000, 2017. And it was not uncommon for the market to look like that as we opened on those mornings. Um, market opened at nine, I'd get there at seven, people were already lined up. And sometimes we have as many as 60, 70 people in line to get some of the first choices for that. We had real crowd control issues with that. Not that there was a problem. The people were wonderful. It just we just had to had to manage that. So that was the market in uh, 2017 in one of our peak years. Um, this is this was the market in 2020. I'm sorry about that little strip there, but I'm afraid to touch it. Um, so in 2020, we still had the pharmacy program, but we had a different model for it uh, with COVID. So farmers would bring their produce to Kane Kitchen, as you can see here, way in on Wednesday, we put bags together and distribute them in a car drive through on Thursday, um, Thursday evenings. So it took all day Wednesday that we gathered and um, uh, brought that food in. Each bag was valued at $32. Uh, farmers were insured these sales because that's one of the big things we want to do is be fair and provide an outlet and a market to the farmers at a, at a, at a premium price so that they keep growing and bringing that back and, and are compensated for all the work that they do. So you can see the line there, MCHC provides a person uh, with our farmer's market to pass that out. So that's uh, sort of closes up on the, on the pharmacy program, but we're, we're looking at a sort of a comprehensive approach, the saying about there's no magic bullet, but lots of uh, buckshot. And this is the Tanglewood Trail, Tanglewood Trail walking program that we've also been doing about five years. Uh, it began with the Marshall University grant on the Diabetes Coalition and has then the second year was picked up with University of Kentucky, Dr. Don Brewer and Annie Copel, who's on here now, I believe. But with that walking, they have, if you walked the mile to the market, the Tanglewood to Trail Market, you got $10 to spend at the market. Um, and uh, participants signed up, data was collected over that period, and significant health benefits were recognized. What's sort of amazing about this one to me is, say it was 16 Saturdays, $160. $160 investment in these people, our community, made a difference in their health. Um, and, and I'm going to let one of them speak right here that, that sort of shares about that. He's been a leader in this walk-in program, uh, Lauren Sturgill and Mimi Pickering with Apple Shop, who is on here in East Kentucky Diabetes Prevention Program, captured this for us. <laughs> I just kept getting white pattern. People didn't know it had no energy back at all. They had no split for the country. I would say it goes around the town. And then it was that. Are others having trouble hearing him? Okay, I'll move on in case we are. We will, we will move on with that in case you okay. were having trouble. Uh, don't, but um, it is, it is there and in the slideshow would be available and you could listen to that as well. Um, and there's a full 12 minute presentation that is also available with that. But there's the socialization aspect, which we do not discount as well as the physical activity and it combined the physical activity and the access to the fresh produce. <laughs> we'll skip that one. But that was wonderful and special thanks to Mimi 
and uh, Parker Hobson for getting that out. Um, also, sort of our work began, and this, this effort began, as Martin said, with the summer food service program and meals that were provided to 18 and under. So this was one of our first, first years when we partnered with Letcher County Public Schools. And that year we did about 700 meals. So uh, Letcher County has 72% free and reduced, and that was a need that we were happy to meet. This year, we had the summer food service program um, as, a re as a response to the uh, pandemic and did box meal kits. This year, we distributed 700,000 meals. We moved from 700 in 2014 to 700,000 from May to August with uh, about 2,500 families and about 5,000 children who came by our largest day passing out over 20,000 meals. This is a video, if you get the slide that you can look at and share also that tells you about that program. Um, I don't wanna take you, I'm not gonna put it there. So the, this is what a meal kit would look like. The Cowan, Cowan Community Action Group is the uh, was the sponsor and Kane was the site. So we passed out um, meal kits for that. That would be seven breakfasts and seven lunches. And then we also included whatever we could get from the local growers as fresh products to go with that. You'll see some kids trying some kale there with the recipe they had for that. Um, just, just hitting that everything was very, very comprehensive. Uh, our camps uh, with Grow Appalachia had meals from there in the summer food service program. Levitt Amp had community meals, uh, was tied to the farmer's market. So a family could, um, perhaps a family from across the mountain could drive to the farmer's market even be reimbursed a $20 gas card from Double Quick if they participated in the backpack program and have a free meal at Kane Kitchen, uh, participate in the pharmacy program and then free live concert music uh, with everybody else. So it's meant to be inclusive. Uh, the Grow Appalachia program helped with canning and food preservation to take that independence for your own, own food. Um, we have the, um, the, the smoothie bike that uh, MCHC provided at the market so kids can make their own. Uh, we're just trying to grow the market stronger. Um, again, more Grow Appalachia is to help gardeners grow their own pr produce. Cane Kitchen is to provide uh, opportunity to, to create value added products. And this you will have also in the, in the presentation, if you get the slide, but this is a document that Central Appalachian Network and through CFA helped put together a few years ago that talks about the impact of healthy foods in Letcher County. And you'll get to hear some details of this if there's an area of interest. List of partners is extensive. Many are medical care providers. Um, and that is a key to this healthy, um, growing this healthy community. Um, that's it. I feel like Thank I'm running out. So <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Val. That was great. A lot of good information. And um, I appreciate others uh, like Mimi and others putting the links in the chat for some of the um, the things that um, Val was mentioning, but um, what about any questions? I thought I saw some in there, Hannah. Uh, yeah, someone wants to know, how do people get to participate in the pharmacy benefits? Um, it happens through MCHC, Mountain Comprehensive Health Corporation. And uh, if you are a patient there, and your, your medical care provider will recommend it. And you're also, uh, it's completely fine to ask about that. Okay, and someone also wants to know, do the providers screen for food insecurity? 
I am not the provider, so I'm somewhat hesitant to answer that, but my, my instinct is, uh, yes, they do. Um, um, I know that ARH did an Appalachian Regional Healthcare did a food assessment and food insecurity was their third item that was a concern in this community. So that's it for now on questions. Make sure to everyone to slide through the chat and look at all the helpful links that people have uploaded for us. Thank you so much, Val. Um, I, I love the innovative thinking and creative ways that um, people have put together their resources to try to tackle this issue. And I loved your quote about no magic bullet, but lots of buckshot. I'm going to be using that one um, in the future because <laughs> I think that's a good way to describe it. We don't have a one answer um, for things often, but we have a lot of little ones that, that might make an impact. Um, although CDC might get mad at me if I have any reference to, to weapons, unfortunately, but I'll try to slip that one in. It's, it wasn't mine. If I went to the first first person, it was uh, it was it was through a, a CFA board member, but uh, not not unique. But um, very, it's made a big impact in our community, and we're very happy that it's it's been here. But I also recognize what Martin says about how we expand it, and know that that's the next step and the need for that. This happens at two markets here that we work with, but. Um, you know, one, one saying that John Paul DeJora has is success unshared is failure. So if, if we don't market this and share this in a way that it spreads, even we, we've not been fully successful. Yeah, so true. And I, I love the, the pivot. I love the way folks were still able to make things happen at the farmer's market, even during the pandemic with all of our challenges, particularly um, when during the shutdown early on in the year. Um, what's the plan this year? We will go back this year. Uh, I just had my second COVID, so I'm feeling a bit a bit more hopeful. And uh, we'll, we'll go use all mandates and even, even recommendations for safety. But our farmers are prepared. We've had our first meeting and are ready. And uh, we know that pharmacy will be happening again this year. We're looking for funding still, uh, continued funding for the walk-in program. The community really appreciates that program as well. So we're, we're hoping to, to be able to do that, expand that. Um, so the Levitt AMP series will begin later, July, to give just a little bit more time to, to expand. And we are also looking at camps, summer camps, but with limited number and um, considerations of, uh, of, of how they attend. 10 a week and the same 10 children and then another 10 children the next week. But we want to we, we want to be here for the community and um, and reach out as, as much as they need. Great, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. Um, another um, very inspiring speaker. So thank you. And um, next up, I think we'll pop up uh, one more poll. Brian, if you could get that one ready. Um, the role in addressing diabetes in your community. And as that's coming up and we start with that one, I'll introduce our next speakers, uh, Ms. April Sandlin with Kentucky River District Health Department and Mr. Jason Brashear at the Heinemann Settlement School. We're gonna talk about diabetes prevention program and diabetes dollars in not county. So we'll wait just a few more seconds for the poll and then welcome our speakers. our poll looking looks like we're just a little over halfway we've got 33 of 64 um, as of right now okay i'll give us like five more seconds quick get your answer in hit submit okay i'll give us 10 i'm going to 10 all right let's pull. <laughs> all right, we're at 56 percent. okay 57 percent okay. and i'm going to end it now
Okay, a lot of folks provide diabetes education nutrition counseling. Great, and we have a, a good bit of a mix of folks doing all of the various things related to addressing diabetes in their community. So thank you all for your participation. Um, all right, next up we have um, Jason and April. Hey guys, uh, I'm Jason Brashear. I'm the Community Programs Director at uh, Hyman Settlement School. And uh, um, my involvement with this is I, I come from an ag background. I worked in extension and then CFA uh, and then come into what was originally the foodways director at the settlement school and, and started working with uh, the local food system here in Knott County. And we'll get into that here in a minute. But uh, uh, my, my co-presenter is April Sandlin. She works with the Kentucky River District Health Department. She's a public health program specialist a diabetes paraprofessional and an LPN. So I'll turn it over to her and let her talk a little bit about DPP uh, and what our um, uh, health department is really doing uh, to address our, our needs for uh, diabetes education. April. When we started the program, one of our things was a grant with universal, uh, university, um, Marshall University, sorry about that. And it was to build our coalition to help support and bring people into our diabetes program. We teach here at the health department. We have a diabetes self-management education program and our DPP. And our big talk today is toward our DPP. It is a year long program, which is tough for people to uh, complete. It's a commitment you have to make for that year long, but it is a great commitment to improve your own health. Um, we do it in seven of our count, our seven counties through the Kentucky River District Health Department. In Knott County alone, we've had 20 people roughly complete the DPP program. Our second sign up for our DPP program here in Knott County, we had I think 35 people show to sign up. Um, that is where our support group spawned from because we found that that's what people were looking for. We had more people that had diabetes show up than those that were at risk for diabetes. And that's what the DPP program is targeted to is those at risk. So from that, we developed our diabetes support group. Um, and we took those that could qualify for our DPP program, DPP program and do that. Um, through our DPP program, we are willing to do what it takes to get our people through our program. Our last group was a group of five. We met at the local park. It was just easier. We had some that worked and things, so we met after work. We had one lady that had a child that really wanted to participate. She was a young lady in her early 20s trying to get healthy again before she has her next child and was at risk for diabetes. So she didn't have a caretaker. So being at the park allowed her to still attend the program. And she lost her 10% uh, weight goal that she had set by being able to do that. Then the weather hit towards the end. So we went virtual with our DP poop program even before COVID come along. So when COVID come along, we were already there because we were having bad weather. So it allowed that and DPP program its goal is to help people lose at least 5% of their body weight to help prevent or decrease their risk for type 2 diabetes. So as we approached and was talking about our program and what we developed with our diabetes dollars, and Dr. Jason, I'll go over that, part of the people we targeted in that and getting them some dollars is our DPP participants. It was our support group participants. We even brought in using them with our diabetes self-management and education group. So I'll turn it back over to Jason. He go over our diabetes dollars. So um, a little a little history in our diabetes dollar program. Um, it's certainly come off of just the fantastic work uh, that uh, that Val and the group in Letcher County was doing. Uh, when I, I come to Hyman Settlement School in uh, 2017. Um, we saw that and we were in awe of what was happening next door and uh, with just a major farmer's market 
Uh, we looked at our farmer's market at that point in time was bringing in about $3,000 a year. So a, a very small market in, in terms of uh, size and scale compared to, to the markets that lie on both sides of us, uh, or I guess all three. Floyd County was rolling. Uh, Perry County has always had a long standing market and Letcher County has been a rock star and, and kind of the, the, the bar setter uh, for us all. So we, we knew we wanted to do something like that when I, when I stepped into my role here and, and uh, about that same time, uh, our Diabetes Coalition was looking for a new home, uh, a new fiscal sponsor. And uh, so, so that kind of brought the Diabetes Coalition into the settlement school and, and kind of opened that door for some dialogue. Uh, and we started off with, um, in 2017, with some DSMS participants uh, at our, our local housing authority, just making sure that they had fresh and local food. Uh, and that was stuff that we were purchasing and, and taking and giving out kind of as, uh, as, as that door prize or as that gift uh, from, from the Diabetes Coalition for those participants. So they got everything from uh, free range and local grown chicken uh, to, to herb packets, uh, uh, to even apple butter at one point in time, because we kind of tried to pair it with whatever the class was. Uh, and one of the classes was on portion control. And, and so we talked, you know, a little bit, a little bit of apple butter is not the end of the world. Uh, eating the whole jar at one time may be the problem. Uh, so, uh, um, but, uh, so that kind of started that conversation with the Diabetes Coalition and local food. And we knew that we really wanted to do some sort of uh, prescription program. And we didn't necessarily have that major uh, um, uh, healthcare provider like MCHC. So, uh, we did have a, a, a pot of money here that could uh, could sponsor this. So in 2000 and I guess 18, uh, I guess we're actually rolling into our fourth year of, of diabetes dollars. But in 2018, we started with um, uh, 500 bucks of diabetes dollars, and and, and we gave that out to uh, the first year. It went to doctors and pharmacists in town that could hand those out to to diabetic patients, um, and. Uh, each person got ten dollars. Uh, they were able to bring that to the market and um, uh, and and exchange that just as cash with our vendors. And at the end of the at the end of the time, we would um, you know pay our vendors back. So that has changed. Now we uh, we give that to our DPP folks. Um, we give folks the opportunity. You know, once once they've used their ten dollars, they can. Uh, if they're still involved in a program, they can. It's kind of a recurring thing during farmers market season, so they can grab some, uh, grab some cash. Uh, we still use our pharmacies uh, and our doctors to pass that out, and 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 we're starting to track which patients, which doctors' patients, with pharmacies actually we see a, a higher redemption rate. So we're we're excited to be able to maybe improve uh, that distribution this year uh, by by looking at at who gave out more last year and who actually had more redemption. Uh, and then, you know, we started out when, when we, we had $500 to work with, I think it was $389 in diabetes uh, dollars that, that come back into the market. Um, and last year it was about 890 uh, of a thousand dollar budget. So we're, we're, our redemption rates are pretty high. We're really excited about it. And, and in terms of size and scale, um, you know, we're, we're nowhere near, uh, the 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 size of what's happening on either side of us but you know for our market it is it is it is it is increased foot traffic and i want to tell a story you know we have 22 percent of our population in knock county has diabetes uh tell a story about uh, a a um, uh, a young lady who who has really jumped in on this program and every time that she can figure out a way to get diabetes dollars she is on it uh, and, and she loves to tell us stories of, of how her A1C has dropped and how, how, how she's lost weight and how just coming to the market, even if she doesn't have diabetes dollars, she now understands that fresh local food is accessible. And this is probably somebody before them probably would have been like, no, I'm not going to the farm. I probably can't afford the farmer's market. But as because of this program, she is now um, a normal every, every Tuesday night market customer uh, regardless whether she has the diabetes dollars or not, uh, and it's it's been uh, it's it's been very fulfilling to to, to watch uh, and and see that uh, that grow. So um, as we go into the future, you know, I think we're probably looking at a, another thousand to twelve hundred dollar a year uh, in terms of where our budget sets and and what we're going to be able to put put into that program. 
Uh, but we really want to make sure that um, um, even even those those folks that pick up those diabetes dollars at the at the pharmacy, they're getting some some more education with it. So we're working on 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 ways of uh, of doing uh, of of making sure that there's there's some education with that with that free money. So that was quick and dirty. I'm glad we're the last one because I think everybody we all, we all like to stare at screens and we got some wonderful things happening. Um, but uh, we'd love to answer some questions about what's going on in Knott County. And uh, we certainly want to thank Val for, uh, for her um, uh, just bravery and push of doing something that was not heard of in Eastern Kentucky and, uh, and, and being successful with it, which is, which is spreading uh, throughout the region. So thank you. I will chime in. If you see my backdrop, this is one of our first flyers that we created that went out with our diabetes dollars. And on that flyer, it has information where to get nutrition therapy from MNTs with our UK Center for Rural Health uh, and June Buchanan Clinic here in Knott County. And I, Keisha is on here that helped us with that. And we have our DSME class, our DPP class. We have several of those up there so that these people that grab these dollars, even if the dietitian hadn't talked to them, the doctor hadn't talked to them, the pharmacist they still had this information to take home and be able to reach out to us and set up their self for some of this information. You, you know, I see your question there, Jennifer. We give $10 at a time and surprisingly, um, $10 seems to be enough and we, we, will, see, we will see folks take that um, they're in dollar increments and they'll take two dollars a week out of that and they'll combine it with with three or four dollars of their own and and buy what they want and um, so it, it it's something that it, it, it doesn't have to be large amounts of money I think uh, once they once they realize what they can buy for 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 five or six dollars at the market they're pretty happy to 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 put in some of their own cash along with their their diabetes dollars um, so it's, I was a little concerned is $10 enough, uh, to draw folks out. And, uh, and it, it has been, uh, and it's really funny to watch them kind of, kind of, uh, ration it out in their head to, to know, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to spend $5. I'm going to, uh, at the market, I'm going to spend $3 of my own and two diabetes dollars. And I'm going to be able to do this for, for, for five weeks. And then some folks come and spend it all at one time and hope and hope that they can get, get more. And if you look at, we actually um, have multiple ways for them to get dollars. So if they come to our diabetes classes or they see our dietitian or June Buchanan's dietitian, they go to the pharmacist, pharmacy every month to pick up their medicine. So when they pick up that medicine, they're getting another 10. So there's ways for them to get multiple dollars before the end of the season. And we usually start it at the beginning of the season and it don't eat into September. So last year, our diabetes dollars, we agreed that they could roll over from the previous year. So you still had some that had those too, if they still had those left over yep. to be able to roll over and use again. And exactly, Martin, to, to your comment, uh, being a double dollars market uh, has been just absolutely tremendous but we see a lot of the same folks that use double dollars also have diabetes dollars and stacking it on top of uh kind of stacking those things up to really make their buying power uh even stronger um you know our, our, our um, um double dollar program has been i'm going to say slow to start uh but but last year we finally broke i think we we doubled about 1400 bucks in 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 snap last year uh, and for us, that's a lot. Um, and, it, and, and, you know, from, from a food system and an agriculture standpoint, which is my background, when it comes to the, the diabetes part, I'm, I will, I, I tell them all the time in the coalition, I'm clueless, but it, it, it's a win-win for our communities. Not only are we putting money in our, in our farmers' pockets, but we're also putting fresh local food on, on, on tables. And, and that means, more than anything, and, and we have some farmers that, uh, during this, during as our market has grown from that three thousand dollar a year market to a twenty two thousand dollar year market, we have farmers that have just really kind of 
latched on and 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 do it because of because of the double dollars program because they feel like they are helping their community eat uh, when a lot of times maybe they would they would never have been a vendor. Uh, Jason, I don't know if you saw this question come through, but someone's wanting some further explanation about the double dollar program. Awesome. I will I will jump in and Jennifer Weber's on and Martin, they're all way more versed than me, but our double dollars um, basically doubles SNAP, um, WIC, and Senior Farmers Market vouchers. Those are all kind of social aid programs where we can uh, double X amount. So if... Um, um, we have a customer comes into the market, they pay $5 um, or they run $5 off their snap card. We give them that $5 plus five double dollars. So then their buying power is doubled and they can spend $10 at the market that day. Uh, it is paid for. Martin, you want to jump on and answer that? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it is the, the double dollar program. I think, as I said earlier, there's, there's actually four incentives in that program. There's the incentives for SNAP folks to double up uh, fruits and vegetables. And as Jason said, also the same for senior and WIC uh, farmers market nutrition programs. And it also, for some markets who have it, um, doubles up SNAP eligible proteins, meat, eggs, and dairy for it. And each one of those different programs has different sources of funding. Um, it's so it's multiple funding sources from including USDA, uh, Kentucky um, Ag Development Fund, but then you know a lot of private funding, including Passport, WellCare, the Foundation for Appalachia, Kentucky, um, <laughs> the Educational Foundation of America. I mean, it's yeah, there's a lot of different sources of funding. Hope that's helpful. April looks like a question for you. Um, what worked to keep participants engaged when DPP switched to online? We started it a little earlier than COVID. Um, like I said, just due to the weather, being allowed to be flexible um, so that participants could reach out to me. I may have had one or two that if we met at five o'clock that couldn't reach out to me in that group, I was flexible. So at seven o'clock, if those two could be on, I was able to go on and talk with them and walk them through their group. So being flexible, there was days that it rained at the park. So we couldn't do it at the park. We would meet here at the health department. Um, but that's that seemed to be what worked best for us at the end was just being that flexible. Um, and having a group that worked really well with each other, willing to open up, talk, and work with each other has really been helpful at keeping them sustained there, helping them build those friendships. Like the last five I talked about, when the class ended, they all wanted to share their telephone numbers because they wanted to come back to the park and walk together as a group to have that safety as a group of women walking together, but that camaraderie, the availability to have somebody talk about things that each of them were going through so they could walk the park. It just helped building those relationships and things that kept a lot of them going and knowing somebody was there to talk to about what they were feeling. That's all we've got. And sorry if I missed it, but did, did um, someone, um, was the question that's in the chat about the package deals. There was something, a question about have market vendors made up package deals for $10 value, like a $10 basket of mixed produce? We, we've not had that a whole lot. Um, we did when, when, when COVID started, we had producers kind of set things up and uh, we're, we're, we're a market that sells by the pound. And uh, so we had, instead of having to handle that produce, we would have them go ahead and have it weighed out in, in normal groups. But we've not necessarily tried to put together a package of, hey, you can do this. You know, we do have a, uh, a producer here that runs a CSA that's delivered at the farmer's market, um, but not necessarily um, using any of the incentives. Hannah, any other questions for that? We might have 
Nope, I think that's it for now. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, um, April and Jason, for sharing that. A lot of great things going on in, in Knott County, and um, we're glad to hear that it was sort of um, sprouted from ideas from, from Val's work. And we hope to see even more of that happening um, from events such as this, where we share this information and other communities can learn about it and see what worked and what didn't and use those best practices to maybe initiate um, some programs in their communities. And um, so now um, let's take some time to talk about actions that we can take. Uh, so we're gonna, we're gonna move into breakout sessions in, in two breakout rooms. We'll have two to choose from. One's gonna focus on programs and that one will be facilitated by um, Ms. Jennifer Weaver from Community Farm Alliance. And then the other will be focused more on policy and that's going to be facilitated by Ms. Amalia Mendoza from the Foundation for Healthy Kentucky. Hello everybody. I think as we're all coming back into the main session, I'll give us just a few minutes. Good discussions. I popped into um, programs for a little bit, but also spent most of my time in the policy side. But really good discussions going there. So I was very glad to see that. And thank you for everyone who has uh, hung in there with us um, through this program. We appreciate you taking time to, to be there for the breakout sessions um, to get into a little more in-depth discussions. That was uh, great to have that opportunity and, and all the input from those who participated. So I think we're having just about everybody back. I think we lost some folks um, who had to, had to step away, who have given their apologies in the chat, but we kept at least three quarters of our crew on online here. Um, okay, so as we move into um, the wrapping up here, so next steps, thinking ahead, um, I'd like to get a little wrap up from each of the breakouts and thinking through um, afterwards with the, the summary, you know, kind of hitting on three main points maybe from each of the breakout sessions, Jennifer and Amalia can, can lead that summary, but then we'll think about how can we work together to move things forward and models that might be able to be expanded and, and sustainability for this. Um, so I think I'll turn it over um, to uh, maybe Jennifer, if you wanna go first and kind of summarize what happened in programs. Sure. Um, we had a great discussion, I think, about um, a lot of different resources. I felt like we were just doing a lot of resource sharing, um, whether it was funding for a program or um, cooking meat, cooking classes or what, whatever the case may be. Um, there are a lot of resources out there and um, there's a lot of willingness to share what's out there and to create models. And so that was really one of the issues that rose up is there are a lot of resources, but coordinating those and putting them in a central location, I think is um, something that came out of that group um, that we having a centralized location where folks can go and see what the resources are, what some models for programs are, who they need to contact for that would be helpful in moving this forward. And then um, our group came out and said, we want to continue to have these conversations, um, maybe a couple of times a year to see what's going on, to make these connections, to continue to build on these relationships. Um, so those really are the three main points that um, I took away from our conversation. Did I miss anything, Hannah? Nope, I don't think so. Thank you. Great, thank you. And now Amalia, if you can sum, summarize from the policy. Yes, and I hope my screen doesn't shut me off. Um, we talked about uh, policies and we talked about focus. I think we focused a little more on state policies than we did on the, on the federal and local ones because there's a lot going on now at the legislature, at the legislature, excuse me. And there's a lot of coordination that needs to happen to move things forward going forward. Um, we talked about the different, I think we mentioned like four or three important bills that um, are making it through the legislative session. House Bill 384 that's related to nutrition for kids. Um, this is the breakfast after the bell bill that would allow kids to have breakfast into, in 15 minutes into the curriculum time. It's passed the house, so that's really good. 
um, with a good proportion vote, um, strong strong support for it. And so now it's going moving on to the Senate. So House Bill 384 is one that we, you know, if you can please support with your organization. Um, House Bill 95 in terms of, of diabetes, this is the one that would cap the cost um, of, the, of the, the insulin, which is really important. And this passed the House unanimously already. So there's strong support for that. And so this could be the year it, it passes um, in the Senate. So again, um, advocacy for that would be great. Um, we've, the foundation has been very strongly supporting the um, House Bill 147 and Senate Bill 81, which are the ones that are going to that are look to try to get um, local control on tobacco products and uh, vaping products. And we know that's a big issue that affects people with diabetes as well and, and many people in, in, in the Appalachian community. Um, that one has not been assigned to committee at all. So that one is one that is kind of lagging behind and we would like support for that. Um, we talked about another really important issue that has become more so during the pandemic, which is telehealth. And um, it was mentioned that, you know, there's, it has increased substantially. There is a committee at the state level that's working on expanding it and making it permanent beyond, you know, making payments for it permanent beyond um, the pandemic. Um, but there still are issues of connectivity of people who don't have computers or can't access computers. It was mentioned that there's, uh, they're using audio phone, for example, which is not easy for people who can't access con a, um, a computer to get telehealth. Um, but um, Colby mentioned that the FCC has what's called the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program, which is $50 per month or $100 towards a computer um, device. And this is facilitated through service providers. So this is something that people can look into. Again, it's the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program. More longer term, um, we talked about a really important thing, which is how to keep expanding programs like the ones that Martin has presented or the, the Letcher County, the double dollars programs and everything. And it is the need to try to increase the Kentucky Health Farm and Food Incentive Fund. Um, this would help with the match that is needed for the federal dollars to come in. So it's to bring more dollars to Kentucky um, and uh, Community Farm Alliance and the food Kentucky Food Policy Network are, are working on expanding the campaign around this. So this is something that we can start advocating more, um, especially those that are in healthcare. I think those are the main um, topics we covered. I don't know if anybody from the group wants to add something. Thank you, Amalia. Yeah, I think you did a really good job of covering that. Um, and thank you everyone for such a great um, discussion and, and covering these really important important points. Um, so thinking about, you know, sort of those next steps, um, one of the ideas that we had um, when I was speaking about this with Amalia and Jennifer was thinking about working groups that we might form and potentially base those off. So have a program, a policy working group, uh, but also having another group that might be that linking health in, because that seems to be a missing piece in a lot of the existing, um, and there are a lot of them, there are a lot of existing networks and associations and groups out there, um, but how can we have one that might focus in a little more on diabetes, particularly linking to um, the, the food side? And we've heard a lot about all of those other programs that exist in, in networking groups, but how do we leverage those existing networks? And so if you wouldn't mind, just pop in the chat if there's um, a preference that you have, if you'd like to participate in one of those working groups. I think we talked about policy programs and then linking health. That's kind of the third one. We didn't really have a breakout about that, but you know, linking health in. How do we link health in to these existing networks and you know, particularly of interest for that farm and food and incentive fund, I think um, Martin made a call to have health support in that. So that might be a way that group could really um, focus. So essentially it kind of covers both programs and policy, but I'd like to have some of that focus on linking health. Um, so yeah, please put that in the chat. And um, another question I had, um, you know, is how often should we meet in a forum such as this? focused on diabetes prevention through healthy foods. Um, that's another one, just pop it in the chat. Would you like to meet um, you know, monthly, quarterly, um, bi uh, uh, semi-annually? You know, wh what would work out best, do you think, to do something like this where we bring in some speakers and um, 
discuss relevant topics and, and hopefully get updates. Like if we could form these work groups, get, get updates at those meetings. And Martin, did you have a comment or question? I did. I mean, I, I certainly would like, um, or the invitation is open to anybody with the Kentucky Food Policy Network um, to be part of those working groups. Um, you, I think on our website, um, and um, maybe Jennifer can put that link back in there, but if you go there and you can click on a work group that you might be interested in, um, and then you'll get, uh, I think, the email to the the organization who's kind of facilitating that group and then you'll get added to that. Um, so they're building out, you know, again, they're building out uh, the kind of listserv uh, for this stuff. And then there will be another um, network broad meeting sometime this spring. Um, the other thing I want to say is that um, we, are, for our, our campaign around the Healthy Farm and Food Incentive Fund, is we are planning to do a, um, a webinar. Uh, we haven't set the date yet, um, but it is around, generally around the issue of hunger um, and, um, and, these other, and these other issues here. And so we, um, and we're, um, we are going to be specifically inviting legislators um, to that. We have uh, a couple champions, um, in the works uh, to lead that effort. So, um, you know, and I will share, we will share the link to that um, with, with everybody on this call, uh, if you want to get into it. Great, thank you. Um, I'm seeing a couple of answers in there about how to meet. So that would be great. Anybody else, please just pop in there what your thoughts are about how often that we should meet in this forum. There, there are other, work groups um, that already exist out there that are part of the networks, but I think we'd like to have maybe a little subsection of this. So um, policy programs and linking health to food. Those are the three work groups I was thinking of for, for this. And, you know, not a lot of burden on, on our work groups. We just want to kind of hone in. It's harder when we have a big group like this to, to kind of hone in on specifics so we can break up our our participants here a little bit and get some input, that would be great. Um, so yeah, just pop into the chat if you're interested in one of those three work groups, that would be great. We're gonna send out um, the materials um, or send a link where you can get those materials. Hopefully we'll be able to post those on our SOAR um, website. And then as um, kind of mentioned earlier, we'll have this session is gonna, it was recorded and we'll have that posted on our YouTube channel. And so we'll send the link to that. We have your emails as part of your registration. Um, anything else that um, you'd like to add, um, Amalia or Jennifer, before I close things out? Because we're getting to our ending time point here. Um, I, I would just add one tiny little thing, and that's because I my other hat is the I'm the coalition coordinator for the Kentucky Coalition for Healthy Children, which is working to improve health for children in schools. And I think schools are a really big partner. We're seeing that diabetes is starting earlier and earlier and so the quicker we can get um, to kids to you know introduce them to healthy foods making that access you know nu nutrition policies in schools the better so always to remember to bring our school partners along and share information about this with schools that's all it's been great being here thank you yeah and schools that would be a great group to bring into this as well as we move forward this was our first uh, time doing this and I I have to admit, we tried to do this a year ago, but COVID kind of put it for us and we were glad we could reconvene and then we got hit with the winter storm. So um, we've had some challenges to make this meeting happen, but I think it really went well today. Um, thank you so much. Jennifer, did you have anything before I hit closing? Margo, great job uh, pulling this group together. Uh, I think we had around 72 to 75 participants the whole time. Oh, great. That's wonderful. Well, one thing I wanted to mention, I noticed it on Julie Stieber's background. If you're still there, Julie, I can't see. I, I don't see all the folks up there, but um, who works with Kentucky Diabetes and Prevention, Prevention and Control Program. But I saw that March 23rd is Diabetes Alert Day, and she has a link up there to doihavediabetes.org. And so it's a way to test um, 
you take a little test and see if you might be in that pre-diabetes group. And then CDC also has one, cdc.gov slash diabetes slash take the test. Um, I'll, I could try to pop those up into our chat, but that's a good, you know, a couple of good campaigns to get the word out. March, thinking of that date of March 23rd, let's try to promote that and have people get some awareness. You know, remember those numbers where 84% of those who are pre-diabetic don't know it. And those are a lot of folks we could be reaching to help prevent them moving into type two diabetes. Um, so I'd like to just end by thanking our presenters, Martin, Sabrina, Val, April, and Jason. Thank you so much for participating and giving all the good information that you shared with us today. And a big thanks to um, my facilitators and those who helped make this event um, work pretty smoothly today. Um, Jennifer, Amalia, Ryan, Hannah, Kenny, and thank you so much to um, Director of SOAR, um, Colby. And I think I'll end there. And maybe Colby, if you want to have a few words to close us out. Uh, I would just say quickly, thanks everybody for being here. I think uh, uh, to Ryan's point, having between 60 and 70 attendees, and sorry if you hear that, I guess they're having a uh, tornado drill uh, fest going on here in Pikeville, but uh, to have 60 or 70 attendees for a virtual event, as everybody understands zoom Zoomitis pretty well at this point is, is amazing. I think the discussion was great today. And uh, as far as next steps, continuing to have conversation, you know, we're very fortunate to have the resources of, of Margo and her counterpart, Kenny, that are stationed here in our region from the CDC. I'm always looking to make sure that they're being leveraged properly and put to work. Uh, so I think this is a great way for us to uh, have them be at that intersection uh, between the, the local and state resources, obviously, but also federal programming and guidance and things there. So uh, if anybody ever has any ideas or, or things um, that we can do to, to help, please let us know. Uh, we also have obviously have partnerships, um, you know, with the KDA, uh, with Kentucky Farm Bureau, with the UK Extension offices, folks that have presences uh, in all of our 54 counties that we uh, that we service. And so we're also always looking for practical ways to get them more involved in, in our communities as well, just from a bandwidth and, and resource standpoint. So anything that we can ever do uh, around these these goals, whether it be regional food systems, healthy communities, whatever the case may be please don't hesitate to reach out because we're always looking to, uh, to find ways to, to work with folks in, in the region that uh, on, on projects that align with those goals. Great, thank you. Look for some emails to um, be headed your way with all of the information I mentioned that we would be sharing. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you all.